Welcome to APEC. It's April 23rd, and I'm your moderator, Tim Ventura. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this call, along with everyone watching us on YouTube. In today's session, Bob Greener will lead a Q&A on exotic vacuum objects. John Brandenburg will discuss Mars radioisotopes, and Rupert Wade will provide funding strategies for inventors and innovators. Mark Sokol and Falcon Space are going to provide detailed lab updates and the results of their latest experiments, and we will be finishing off the event with an open discussion and ad hoc presentations by conference attendees. So let me do the usual reminders. You can view conference replays, details, and speaker info on our website at www dot alt propulsion dot com. Please save those questions for the Q&A session after each presentation. Today's a little bit special because we're starting out with Q&A, so that doesn't necessarily apply for our first presenter. And you can raise your hand in Zoom using option Y on Mac or alt Y on Windows. You can also type those questions in the chat. We're going to go through those after each presenter finishes. So I want to introduce you once again to our first guest. Bob Greener will be conducting a Q&A session on exotic vacuum objects and discussing their role in stuff like Hutchison effects, nuclear transmutations, other energy and materials effects that might be applicable to future propulsion and space systems. Uh, Ken Shoulders, the originator of the EBO model, described an EBO as a cluster of electrons that channels energy. Ken believed that he had used the electron's energy to melt microscopic holes in various materials. There is a ton of stuff here, and Bob has really just mastered all of it. So let's welcome Bob to today's event, and I will hand it over to him to get started. Hi, guys. Thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Uh, I was doing a late presentation last night, so if, if I look like I've got narcolepsy, then that's the reason why. <laughs> um, uh, so really, uh, fire away with your questions. Uh, my answers will be focused on what I know. I will uh, bat away uh, uh, questions uh, that I have no expertise in, uh, if that's OK with people. Um, but I'll, I'll take a stab at some uh, more general questions. So uh, without further ado, um, I've got a lot of materials ready to pull up uh, should uh, questions uh, necessitate some corroboration. Um, but with that said, uh, fire away. Awesome. Again, we're, we're doing things we're doing things a little bit different. So, Bob, I actually I have you spotlighted. Let me let me take the spotlight. I'm going to remove the spotlight there for the time being. Uh, and I think I removed mine as well. So yeah, uh, again, we're going right into Q&A, which is throwing me for a loop here. Option Y on Mac or Alt Y on Windows. And I, I will start, let me start with the first one. Doug Lindstrom is having audio problems. Um, he was wondering if you could comment on the trails left by EVOs on photographic paper and if the Instamatic photo packages would work for that application. Okay, so um, uh, you're going to put me full screen? I don't know. Um, actually, I discussed a bit about this last night and I have uh, purchased a Instagra Instagraphic uh, camera for this purpose and I did a a sort of a discussion about it. We are going to actually use those uh, films in a number of experiments. So I may be able to give you an answer uh, before the end of the year as to whether they, they panned out. But certainly, is, if you're aware, Kodak uh, found out that, that, that there was some nuclear testing going on uh, because their films uh, way back in the day uh, were showing these spots all over them and people were buying their, their films and found the, find the, to find, only to find that they'd already been exposed. And so Kodak was actually uh, let in on the fact that uh, there was uh, nuclear testing going on before the general public was so that they knew when and where uh, so when if the wind was blowing in their direction uh, they could avoid doing a manufacturing run uh, for a period of time until the uh, ambient radiation was below a level where their product would be useless and so there was a guy i can't remember his name but if you go to um, the uh, mfmp youtube channel you can see a video it did on this where a guy took some instant film and he found that uh, if you he, he actually had an x-ray source and uh, it was a you know something for making x-rays uh, and 
he actually took films and found that the Instamatic film was susceptible to X-rays uh, after it gone through the camera for a, a period of time, like 20 seconds. So then you could you actually expose the film uh, with, with a, you know, no actual light going into the Instamatic camera. And then you could then take that film and expose it to the source. However, th that's not really very useful for the work that we're looking for. We're, we're looking for um, uh, uh, accumulation of things over a period of time, rather than trying to find the right 20 seconds of your experiment to expose a film to. Um, so uh, I actually uh, am a pro proposing that we take the, the film. So I actually have, I have a, in, one, I, I, these mini Instax here, this is a wide angle one. And uh, th this was just one uh, for testing when we're doing testing. So actually they come in packs of 10. And the idea is that you would expose because we're looking for things that would ordinarily go through the shielding that would shield normal material. And in fact, on the outside of Instax, camera, in Instax cameras, they, 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 it comes in a foil packaging. And on the box, it says, avoid being exposed to x-rays. So they, they are aware that x-rays will cause some damage to the film. But we're not just talking about x-rays, we're talking about uh, charge clusters. And charge clusters can uh, be in the neutral way. They can pass through a, a, a range of materials until they get excited to a such a point that they dishevel. And then they throw out their electrons and the ions that they're carrying. And this has been studied uh, by the group at Dubna uh, since 2009 and uh, earlier from the group uh, uh, in, in Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute, uh, Bogdanovich. And they have found that uh, and other uh, other Russian authors principally, but uh, they, they have found that it goes through a number of sheets of, of material. And this was also observed by Matsumoto. So if it, I don't know if you're aware, but since we last spoke, uh, we have produced uh, a facsimile of the Matsumoto steps to um, uh, the discovery of electronuclear collapse. So you can go to remoteview.icu and download this full PDF. I think it's about 310 megabytes, 289 pages. It's a faithful one-to-one -one reproduction. Uh, but in this, uh, I think you will find that a number of his experiments, he actually like had a, um, a, an electrode and uh, below the fluid, he would have uh, some metal. And then behind that, he would have a stack of, of uh, actually real nuclear emulsions. Uh, but he found that it would go through a, a number of them and then it would get to the point of being excited and it would bounce around between two of the emulsions and you would get tracks on both. Other authors have found that, that you get uh, uh, coincident tracks as it goes through a number of layers. For instance, I think it's Perovstikov uh, was looking at harnessing these electron clusters by having the south pole of uh, 0.4 Tesla magnets under a bowl of water in a sealed chamber and, and exposing it to the sun uh, for 10 days. He thinks it's some sort of solar uh, photon, but it, it is actually clusters coming from the cosmos. And they aggregate and they bind to the oxygen dissolved in the water. And then you can fire a small uh, domestic sort of $5 uh, milliwatt uh, class laser at it. And that this excites and, and decouples these clusters. And then he used standard 400 AS, ASA film. Uh, and he would see the same kind of tracks that Bogdanovich and his team at the Moscow Physics and Nuclear Institute and uh, the, the Dubna uh, Science City group has, has observed. So my, my, my view on these is you take off the foil wrapping and then you take the stack of 10 and you sit it next to your reactor. And I would choose to have the, a strong neodymium magnet behind uh, in, in some stacks with a, a south pole and some stacks with a north pole uh, because you get clusters of both. Uh, um, and, and also you could have uh, no magnets. And then once it's exposed to a reactor for a long period of time, then you uh, would then put it through the camera. But in this case, you would blank off the lens <laughs> and, and just pass them, run them through the camera and, and let them uh, develop. So it's, it's a non-known entity at this point. There's an opportunity to, for someone to be a first to demonstrate this, but then you have to have a reliable way of making uh, exotic vacuum objects charge clusters. And that is a different subject. So I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I, I mean, that's, yeah. I, and again, his audio is down, so maybe he'll ping me again on that. Um, and I had a couple others in chat also, but let me, let me go to Aiden now. 
Uh, hey, Bob. Um, first question is fairly innocuous. It was um, it was in one of your YouTube videos. You had a really useful website that showed um, nuclear physics or um, you could go up and look at like element 115, 116 and get a uh, proton and neutron count on it. Um, I... uh, well, you can go to ptable.com and that is an okay. extremely useful uh, uh, site. And it, it shows the uh, many of the uh, artificial nuclear uh, tides that were synthesized actually mostly at Dubna, uh, the science city north of Moscow. Uh, and typically they take a very, very heavy element and they fire alpha particles at it until they make something super heavy. And so, yeah, so if you go to ptable.com, I'll do it right now. And uh, um, uh, maybe not on the screen, you're, you're seeing me on. Um, I'm going to move you off so I can actually see. Uh, and if you're thinking of uh, ptable.com, um, yeah, if you're thinking of element uh, 115, is that is it, what, what element are you after? Yeah, it was the, uh, the mythical element 115, but they... Uh... So, so that is, funnily enough, Muscovium. Right, right. <laughs> because it was developed by this team at um, uh, in Dubna. In fact, many of these elements uh, in uh, above uh, Hassium. Uh, were developed there. In fact, I think, uh, in fact, uh, 105 is called Dubnium from, okay. from Dubna, Science City. So, uh, you know, the, the really the Russians uh, are very, very good at this kind of thing. Um, um, so. Then the other, other question was the uh, uh, vacuum capacitor or EVO enabled vacuum capacitor. Um, yeah, so there's a group that came from a, a Russian person uh, uh, and I've actually contacted them and uh, I actually have some of the uh, ones that are listed in their pattern over here on the shelf uh, in this little package here. And they're, they're made in the old Soviet Union. Uh, maybe I'll get one out for you. Um, but this is the one that they claim uh, was the test sample for their uh, awarded patent or the patent that's pending. I don't know whether it's actually awarded, to be honest. Let me gnaw my way into this for a few seconds. <laughs> um, but essentially, the idea is that um, you create the conditions for charge cluster formation and you just uh, add and add and add the energy. And uh, uh, when you've seen some of the videos that we've shared over the, over the years uh, with what they do. So this is, this is a, a vacuum uh, triode. This is, like, I think it's a, uh, what is it? It's a uh, uh, V078, uh, it's a 6A6A slash B, or that's what it looks like in, in Russian. I don't know if you can. You can see that, but this is this is the thing. But it, it has a, a thermionic emitter, I think, uh, and it has what you would need for for this kind of concept. And then what you would do is you you would put like a your counter electrode on the outside, and uh, you're effectively it doesn't ever get discharged. You're building up the charge in there, and then you would discharge through one of the leads. And that's essentially kind of what they're doing. They're looking at types types of ceramics, and, and I suggested to them boron nitride because of the way that. Uh, EVOs like to eat anything covalent, uh, sorry, um, ionic. You need to have covalent materials to store them. But even those will fail at some point. So I don't know. They they said that they were um, advancing their work last year and that there would be opportunities to uh, maybe interact with them uh, after that. But I, no real advancement has been there. And one of my colleagues uh, working on the Vega set of experiments, he contacted them again and, and got a, a bit of a deadpan response. So um, but, um, you know, they, they are building their technology based around exotic vacuum objects and the reality of them. Um, and I, I wish them every success because the potential uh, for storage of electrons uh, in an incredibly small volume is just breathtaking. Uh, the only question I have is uh, how do they keep them stable um, such that they, they don't do uh, random destructive events? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they might get away with it a thousand hours and then they might not. So, um, so you know, a hall, hall back array around that, I mean, a hall back array. So you have, um, you know, a magnetic confusion, uh, <clears throat> magnetic confinement within. Uh, well, it, well, to do any type of confinement for EVOs, you, you have to keep them uh, in a non-neutral state. And so you have to feed them electrons. So you need to have them so that they express uh, a, a magnetic and, a, and a electric 
uh, or they are rather, they are able to be uh, controlled by electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and um, Shoulders used a penning trap, uh, which is a combination of both. But to be able to trap them, you have to keep them fed with uh, electrons. The, alternatively, you can bind them to nuclei. So, uh, but they, they they live in the can according to shoulders they can live in metals indefinitely and in our research uh, a researcher lion was able to revitalize uh, some that were apparently in his copper oxide of his lion reactor nine months later and when i showed this to uh, some russians uh, in sochi in 2018 they said oh that's nothing we've managed to get them to uh, come back to life after 18 months and, and then all they did was they put it out into sunlight to re-excite them um, and so there's a range of ways you can re-excite them. Obviously, you've got uh, IR photons uh, in, in sunlight. Uh, in the case of L the Lion researcher, he heated it up to 800 degrees, which is by his thermocouple, which is actually 1,040 degrees in reality. Um, and uh, that, that was for a period of time, and that was able to re-excite them. In, so he could, re he could see these tracks again on X-rays uh, post that event. Um, now, uh, other researchers have found, so for instance, the Bogdanovich found that when he used plasma flow discharges and, and captured the uh, things flying out, um, uh, no, sorry, it's uh, Leonid Oritskev when he exploded titanium foil and he produced ball lightning and he produced strange radiation tracks and he produced the magnetic monopoles that changed the fine constant, uh, fine magnetic uh, moment of uh, iron 57. He found that that, that that faded away after two days. Now the question is, it's, is it still bound to the 57 nucleus or is it uh, um, in a state of uh, not being able to express that change to the magnetic fine moment of the uh, nucleus? Is it still there and it just needs to be re-excited? I don't know, but uh, certainly when I was looking at ultrasonically produced ones in the work of uh, Suhas Ralkar, his fuel was very active and then not very active in terms of strange radiation em emissions over a period of a couple of months. Um, uh, but I imagine that if I take that fuel and treat it in one of the aforementioned ways, like exposure to sunlight, exposure to uh, direct uh, thermal photons, um, it might re-energize it. So yeah, so, so the, the short answer is you have to keep them alive to be able to control them. When I say alive, you don't want to make ghost particles out of them. If they're ghost particles, they'll go literally where they want. Uh, and then they might get excited somewhere else. And then you have a problem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think I think you got an Aiden muted himself out. So uh, let me let me go to Robert next. Robert, sir. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Hi, Robert. How you doing? All right. Uh, I can't believe how much time it passed since you did your talk in January. Um, you were talking about neutrons interact with uh, other matter, which cause a lot of gravitation. And then shortly after, you would talk about Matsumoto. No, not, not, sorry, not, not neutrons, uh, cold neutrinos. These are oh. not, they're not relativistic nuclear derived neutrinos. They are um, the same. There's firstly, you've got a vast amount of material left over from the supposed Big Bang, but that, I don't believe that's necessary for this to occur. But anyway, um, there's a lot of this material out there about two Kelvin. It's already in a coherent state. And uh, uh, it apparently is at a density where it's one coherent condensate across the entire universe. And this rains down on the earth. Uh, um, and it, it, this might be the infinitesimal uh, corpuscles that was referred to by Tesla that were not solar derived. And um, these, these things have more mass potentially than all of the luminous matter in the entire universe. And it fits to the pressure model of uh, um, gravity. And so, uh, and in fact, there was a 2010 article by the CERN theory group that suggested that these relic neutrinos could, um, their properties and how they interact with matter could account for all of the observables of what we know as gravity. Now, you can technologically produce these according to the author that I've worked with, and I translated his book, Alexander Parkamov. He had started to research this uh, following doing uh, the equivalent of Hal Putoff in the Psychic Spy program. The skills that he learned in that, uh, he then took forward into um, 
observing this type of radiation. He worked on atmospheric research and he was a nuclear scientist doing radiation monitoring as well. And he was able to lens some type of matter, which at the time he called N radiation, onto uh, beta isotopes. And he chose particularly uh, strontium-90, yttrium-90, and also uh, cobalt-60. Cobalt-60 because it has a much shorter half-life than even tritium, but also it's a solid target. So the density of atoms that you are interacting with is automatically much, much higher than those people that are using tritium as a uh, neutrino, cosmic neutrino uh, target. And so, yeah, so basically it's, it, the neutrinos can be technologically generated, it would appear, by any matter, any dense matter or dense plasma that's over a thousand degrees centigrade. And the higher you go, so for instance, um, I discussed in early 2020 with him about the possibility of using uh, tungsten to generate these in the form of tungsten filament, partly because Langmuir had observed uh, gas production in the 1910s, and that was probably related to this. But a 100 watt filament light bulb will be around about 2600 degrees centigrade uh, at full brightness. And so that is well above the threshold of 1000 degrees centigrade. And at that point, you get something like, I think it's around about 50% of the dense matter producing relic, uh, sorry, the relic neutrino equivalent cold neutrinos. Now, these things are actually produced by the sun, but their velocity isn't it high enough to escape the, gra the gravitational way, well, the push down on the sun uh, itself. So they just stay on the sun, according to Parkamov, and participate in the nuclear reactions that go on there. So we don't get, we get a, a, Sorry, almost, I negligible, had to turn it down. We get a almost negligible green, um, uh, flux yes. from the sun. Uh, it comes from the cosmos. So you can use the cosmos ones, but then if you're technologically producing them, you're going to get a lot, lot more. And so he's run some experiments last year using uh, tungsten filament. In fact, he used halogen light bulbs. And then he had it in a literally a halogen light bulb. And he um, had this in a mass flow calorimeter, which is just flowing water through that. He just, he just uh, silicon sealed the electrical parts of the halogen light bulb and then immersed the whole bulb in water. And then separately from that, he had a range of materials. And uh, he, uh, I, I realized that fluorine, because it, it, if it's nuclear magnetic moment, and also uh, because it's a single isotope, is a, a perfect fuel for charge clusters. And uh, we would potentially demonstrated that by using PTFE with HHO and Mars of gas variety in Japan in 2019. But he actually used lithium fluoride, and that's a twofer. Um, and he had that in a, um, uh, a chamber uh, next to the halogen light and uh, got a significant, it would appear, thermal gain over control substance and accounting for the uh, um, weight uh, sort of calori calorific properties of the materials and their variants. So, so lithium fluoride say, seemed to be a fantastic target. So when you say cold neutrinos, are you comparing a temperature to say a plasma or the sun? So no, it's, when you think about cold neutrinos, they are, you can imagine a gamma ray and what a gamma ray can do. And you can imagine a thermal photon. They're both photons, but their properties are extremely different because of the energies and, and velocities, okay? So um, the, the the fact that uh, in, in it's the de Broglie wavelength of a, a cold neutrino is in microns to millimeters. So if you've got them in a, a cluster and they're sitting there with unstable isotopes that really, really don't want to be... So, so basically, a, a, a the, the fact that a material is unstable, it says it's, it's, its ontological will is to become stable, right? And the idea is that there's some random process and, and no one knows what it is, and that causes a thing to decay. Well, that random process, in my view, is the statistical flux in any given location of uh, relic neutrinos on the radioactive matter. Now, you can increase that by putting the, a, a magnet, you can put your nuclear radioactive material through uh, in, in between a, a, a magnet, okay, uh, uh, two magnets. And, that, and there's even patents for this, for increasing the rate of nuclear decay. And in my view, that's because it's, it's pushing an increased flux of uh, these relic neutrinos through the uh, nuclear material. Now, if you can then synthesize relic neutrinos and what happens in this uh, dense matter over a thousand degrees, uh, you get enough energy, it's 0.5 of an EV of electrons or other atoms colliding. 
that it synthesizes a relic uh, equivalent of a relic neutrino, but a cold neutrino and anti neutrino pair. And that's that's his understanding. And uh, we have a calculator based on that, and it's rudely good at predicting outcomes in, in the field in terms of okay. you know what has been historically observed and, and what you might predict would occur if you put several things together in a, in a future experiment. So it, it, it helped me to understand that if you use lithium and fluorine, um, then uh, in, that would give you a good outcome, and that's what he got a best outcome with. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> it's like Thanks for clear, correcting me. Thank you. That's okay. um, I thought I thought it was interesting. You went directly to an application of lightning. Uh, I have a note. This is what Matsumoto said is what all lightning is. Um, can you elaborate elaborate on that? Okay, so in the case, uh, if if we step to what um, Shoulders did, a lot of studies on lightning. And he said that the, the leader, the feeler at the head of a lightning bolt is actually a ball lightning. And this is a, an exotic vacuum object. And I would uh, be fairly confident in saying that Matsumoto would agree with that. We actually have his email of, of a few days ago. And, and we're you starting- talk about all... step leader? Uh, so basically it's like, um, it's the tracer that traces out the ionized channel. Before and the light from the lightning. So, and, and, and if you, you actually see. watch it slow down lightning, you get a ball that comes down and then it gets, in my view, it does exactly what we're seeing in the Vega Valley. It gets overexcited. It consumes too much matter. And in this case, it's probably nitrogen because it's 78% of the air, nitrogen 14. And it comes down, it's consuming that matter and oxygen, 20 something percent of the air. And it, it, it's building more and more coherent matter. And as it comes down, it then splits. And then you get another feeler going out and then then you split. So you get forking and forking and forking of the feelers. But then the first that hits the lower, sorry, the higher potential, let's put it like that, um, depending on whether it's cloud to cloud, cloud to ground or ground to cloud, uh, will then provide the discharge channel. And then through that discharge channel, you'll have multiple pulses going through. Because um, I understand now, through Feynman's lectures of physics, the step leader goes from ground up and then the lightning from the, from the clouds down following step Well, it's leader. interesting because yeah. in that, now there are some extremely good, I think I think the, the high speed guys did some, uh, 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 took some material uh, off the, the uh, three tower boat thing in, in, in uh, Singapore. Uh, and uh, you can oh, see boat. where it comes down. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of standing up there, but I never got <laughs> I to stay in the hotel, but also in I the may pool, interject. <laughs> I know exactly where it is. And, and so the lightning comes down and uh, sorry, the, the feeler comes down, the, the ball lightning comes down, as I described, and then spreads out to multiple channels. It hits the ground or the other way around or between the clouds, depending on the potential differential. Um, and then you, you then have something going back up. Now, it, yes. that, that could be the exotic vacuum object uh, 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 columbically exploding. And what you're seeing is it riding up the channel. Before the lightning, before the, so it the actually, lightning. so because we've actually produced uh, these columbic explosions from uh, um, Evos in the Vega experiments, so you can see them very clearly. And in the presentation I gave last night, you can actually see what's going on in terms of the structures okay. that that form the core of of ball lightning, and and you can actually see the breakup products and stuff. Huh. So. Yeah. Uh, one more well, question. Well, uh, are... Actually, Robert, let me, if it's okay, let me, let me go to okay. Harold next and we'll, we'll, come, okay. we'll come, I back. can come back later. Yeah. yeah. No worries, we'll, no we'll, we'll just, we'll just loop around here. We'll loop yeah. around here. I just want to make sure everybody, you know, gets, gets equal time. Um, let me go to Harold next. Harold. Oh, thank you. Hi, well, Harold. Uh, hi. The green game, obviously, I mean, after watching your presentation, you obviously offer a banquet of food for thoughts. So that makes me wonder, uh, what drives your research? What is your research methodology and what purpose drive it to do what you're doing? Because you have a lot of interesting things. Now, the second part of my question is, related to the more specific, is, can you address on the application of element 115 in proportion, like you have been discussed about Bob Lazar, and others, can you uh, elaborate on, on the second part? Okay, so on the first part, why am I interested in this? It, frankly, and it might sound a little bit weird, uh, before I was, I think, seven or eight or whatever, certainly before I was 10, 
I, I, I had a series of dreams and I, I, I was told I'm going to have something very difficult to do. I have no choice. It's going to be a burden and it's going to be in my 40s. And, um, and so I've always known that I would have to do this job. Um, it's, it's something that I couldn't take profit from. I couldn't become fantastically wealthy from. Um, but it would be my 40s and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 50 on September the 23rd. Uh, so if anyone wants to send me a birthday card, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so um, I actually started the project and it, it really hit the ground almost on my 40th birthday, which was surreal. Uh, and I really didn't know what I was talking about uh, in any degree for the first six years. Um, and and it, it, it's kind of like a, an iterative process. What makes me tick? Well, I had one child and I desperately wanted more children. But in 2006, I'd gone to the peak oil conference in County Cork, self-funded. Uh, and I walked away from there and said, there's literally no hope for planet Earth. I mean, one of the speakers were, formerly worked at CERN and he says, you know, to get enough uh, fissile material, fu so fusion material to run a one megawatt reactor for one year, we'd need to process three times the volume of the Zambezi uh, which is the third largest river in the world, uh, 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 to just produce that amount of, of material to run one reactor. Of course, there's different methods that have been developed since that. But I walked away from there and, and, and he, he touted the phrase where it, it, it said there or, or other, and other areas, they were saying uh, that the Russians gave the tokamak uh, to uh, the West to waste all their research dollars. Uh, and I'm probably pretty convinced of that's the case now. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I came away thinking because it, it was a peak oil conference, like the oil's going to run out uh, and the the uh, the uh, nu nuclear fusion's never going to come. I, I had witnessed the 1989 episode with uh, Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons. And so I had in the back of my head, uh, you know, if I get an opportunity to make a difference uh, with my skill set, then I would. And I realized I'd have to walk away from everything I'd done. And honestly, I can say it's the best decision of my life other than personal decisions, family wise. And uh, I couldn't imagine meeting more interesting people. Uh, the science is incredibly engaging. And you're meeting, I mean, the opportunity to meet uh, the top scientists in Japan, in, in the US, in basically every country on earth. Um, it's been a real pleasure and an honor uh, to do this, this thing that I had to do. And uh, I think we're nearly at the end of it in terms of uh, establishing it as a real thing. Um, and so I, I just can only say that, um, Thank you to people like uh, uh, John Hutchison, to Ken Shoulders, to, to uh, Takaki Matsumoto, and, and to the characters like those who went out on a limb when there was no one else to reference. In fact, the first papers I received from Takaki Matsumoto were from a, a guy uh, in, uh, uh, hot, uh, in Denmark, and he was noting on those papers, he was a collector of uh, papers in the cold fusion field. And he was noting on the fact that Takaki Matsumoto, and you'll see it in his book, he was only referencing himself for the first four or five years. And that's because no one else was doing the work. Everyone else was trying to make neutrons and gamma rays and helium, but they weren't looking at what was ha happening in their re reactors physically. Mm -hmm. And he was a person whose entire education was to look at uh, 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 nuclear emulsions. And so uh, he did what he knew how to do, which is look at a nu nuclear emulsion. He goes, well, that's not a that's not an X-ray. That's that's not a triple track. That's what's going on there. This is crazy. This went all through all this apparatus and it's left this weird blob. What is it? And he started publishing these things and he was able to publish them in the American Nuclear Society's uh, journal until uh, 1994, when he mentioned ball lightning. And then they stopped, they changed the rules. <laughs> so he couldn't publish. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so about uh, element 115, the uh, Muscovium uh, as synthesized in Dubna, I believe, probably most likely by some of the people, in fact, one of them probably Shishkin that I'm translating his work right now. Um, he, um, uh, th that uh, would almost certainly be unstable. I think it is very unstable. Now, there is a question where you, if you add a certain number of neutrons, you might get to a point of stability. Um, so is, is element 115 uh, a mythical thing? Is it a combination of elements? Is it 
that you take muscovium and you load it to death with exotic vacuum objects and that becomes stable, i.e. the muscovium is able to stabilize exotic vacuum objects. I don't know, but I'm pretty certain that all exotic uh, technologies, all exotic energy technologies will be using exotic vacuum objects, charge clusters, uh, itonic clusters, ball lightning type coherent matter. Um, so maybe it's a combination of the two. Uh, because the descriptions, uh, for instance, of Boyd Bushman, of these material that's recovered from spacecraft where they're able to run, you know, a whole lab by connecting it through the equipment to ground, um, does talk of something that is storing either a fantastic amount of charge or it's able to cohere uh, energy from the vacuum. Uh, when I say that, um, I mean cold neutrinos or really neutrinos <laughs> and, and convert them into electrons or whatever. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, uh, that that's all I can say on that, really. I, I mean, I, I deal mostly with what I can physically see and repeatedly produce uh, that has a, a long, long tradition of observation by third parties who I respect. Um, I don't know Bob Lazar. Um, uh, I, I, you know, uh, he has this experience uh, that he lived through. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure what I found in in this journey is that there's always an element of truth. And I've thrown the word element in there and it's not meant to be a pun, but there's always an element of truth in statements. But if he's working for a covert operation, I can pretty much tell you for certain that what he was told was not necessarily what it was. Oh, <laughs> thank you. But uh, in your conclusion, will it produce a proportion force, will be useful for proportion, even if you add the exotic vacuum object to make it stable. Uh, is there a possibility, you know, let's say a way in which you can make element 115 to produce a unidirectional proportion force? Because that is- uh, if, if that question. was his claim, well, then that claim. was his claim. But I, I think it mm -hmm. probably was uh, an energy source for the, the equipment that pro otherwise produced the vectors. That looks like, I would agree with that, you know, there seems to be more energy because he claimed, okay, it may be producing energy, he didn't say that is that is producing a proportion force, I mean, he kind of vaguely uh, speculate on that, and that is the question, is the element 115 the element that will produce the, the force that generate the proportion, and that's a part, but I would agree with you uh, on that part that it may be like a battery, a supply of energy. If it can get energy from the vacuum, something like that, but there is a still a mystical open question. Hey, thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. You're doing great. You know, it's a pleasure, Harold. <laughs> Harold, thank you as thank you as well. Let me so let me actually let me go to chat real quick. Kate had a question. Longtime lurker, Kate, who who has been at these conferences for months and months. Um, she asked, "What would Bob need to build? What would Bob need in order to build an actual SEV utilizing the potential of EVOs?" What, what would I, well, firstly, a willing team. And when I say a willing team, uh, I don't mean people that just want to get paid. My father always said a, a, a volunteer is worth 10 forced men. Um, you need to have a team that have the aptitude. Uh, and so it comes down to people and people that are on the same page. I, I do know someone that, that actually spent seven months uh, going through my previous videos to learn my journey, the errors that I made and so on. And now I can have a sensible conversation with them without having to repeat myself over and over and over. Um, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't wish what I've had to go through on, on uh, anyone. But um, I can say that uh, uh, I, I can help people get more immediately to the answers rather than making all the mistakes I've made. So what would I need? Um, uh, firstly, a tolerant uh, environment. So for instance, we, we are trying to get some tritium uh, to demonstrate the tritium remediation for fixing the 1.3 uh, million tons of uh, Fukushima uh, tritium-laced wastewater. And I identified a process where uh, we can take HHO generated in from, and it would be TTO in, in part, from uh, um, a generator, ideally with some sound involved, so it's similar to a Mars gas if it's not a Mars gas. 
and then uh, uh, expose that to uh, calcium carbonate in, in a way that, uh, that the carbon dioxide is driven off and you get calcium oxide. This is already known to work in Lena, Lena but from the 1820s, this is actually exactly limelight. And there's a phase transition around about 2,100 degrees C. Um, and uh, this allows uh, for you to get a lot of relic neutrino equivalents being synthesized and the remediation of the tritium. And also because calcium is mostly calcium 40 and it can go all the way up to 48, it can be a huge neutron acceptor. And so this has a, a lot of grounding and they didn't buy it. And so we then went to, um, uh, we, we found a solution. They said that we want some more qualitative and quantitative data. And we said, well, we, we can pay to come and test at your uh, facility uh, in Fukushima. Uh, we will pay your scientists to use your, their equipment or not uh, to analyze what we're doing. They're not interested. Um, so we had to find another way. So we found a device, it's about 20,000 euros, uh, and it's actually used for testing radioactive elements in, say, water, right? And it actually comes with 10 mil uh, tritiated water as a calibration source. So the proposal that we're making is to use a calibration source, multiples of it, process the calibration source, have another bit of calibration source, and see the difference in, in radioactive output using the device that is used for testing uh, uh, radioactive material. So it's an absolute slam dunk. And you know what? We can't get any university anywhere any company that has one of these devices or anything, because you know what, you have to have a radiological uh, license to receive radioactive material in order to do the test. And uh, there's a nuclear authority in the UK, and they, they want to uh, uh, help advance uh, new technologies in uh, nuclear, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, research, we wrote to them and their response was this too, this is too advanced for us. So it might not be that there's a conspiracy by most people to prevent this from happening. It might just be that the rules are in place such that everyone that could enable it to happen automatically prevents it from happening. It's not that they are talking to someone. The rules are already set in place globally. So you can't find out that, for instance, atomic hydrogen can do all this magical stuff. OK, so, so the, 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 the most important thing is the right kind of labor. The second, and, and willingness and, and actual determination to find out the answers. The, the, the second thing is a, a location that is capable of doing the kind of research we would need to do. And if you look at what happened to TL Carr, as soon as he started claiming that he was getting things flying around, uh, uh, he was shut down. You know, so um, you've got a real problem with these things. Uh, so you need to have a friendly, the right people, the right uh, legislative environment and the right location. So the only other way you can do it is to do it completely in secret. And, and that's not me. So that's not going to happen. It's going to be completely out in the open all of the time, whether you like it or not. <laughs> that, that way you can't undo, you can't, you can't put the, the, the toothpaste back in the tube. It all becomes public knowledge, right? So, so those would be my prerequisites. Pre it, it's not that necessarily you need a lot of money, actually. You don't necessarily need a lot of money. You need the right amount of money. If you give people too much money, they stop working. If you don't give them enough, they can't work. So you need the right amount of money to match the team in the right environment with, with, with uh, you know, it, 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 it really is a tough cookie to crack. Um, but, you know, uh, if, if there's something we can find a solution to, let's do it. Let's do it as a group. Awesome. Awesome. I, I agree. Oh, uh, sorry. I think that that might have been Kate right there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let, I have a so, question. I have a question. Have well, a question. well, actually, Lulu, if it's okay, I'm trying to do these in order. Let, let me go to "It Is Possible" next. Okay. Okay. Sorry for no cam. Um, I do have a question for you, Bob. So glad to see you here again today. Your last presentation was such a mind blower that uh, at the end of it, I was laughing because the audience was silent. It was just such a plethora of information. But today I wanna to ask you an interesting question that maybe you haven't thought much about, and that is antimatter in relation to this system. Let's take a look at, you know, the, the, the Schwinger limit is a quite fascinating phenomenon. And when we talk about uh, electron neutrinos and electron clusters, these things have so much momentum and they have so much energy concentration, it might be very possible for them to suppress the Schwinger limit, which I believe is 
perhaps part of the explanation for why you're getting transmutation of elements, but I wanted to ask you about antimatter and its production. Have you looked for it? Have you tested for it? And have you done anything regarding, say, positrons being produced or anything on those lines? So uh, if you actually look at what the theory is for Takake Matsumoto, what he says is you get an electron cluster around your nuclear matter. Now, for every atom, regardless of what atom it is, you have at least one electron for every proton. The neutrons are neutrons, right? <laughs> so if we start with protein, which is one proton and an electron, you've got a proton and an electron, okay? Uh, if you've got deuterium, you've got a proton, a neutron, and electron. So for every positive charge, you've got a negative charge, okay? Now, what he's saying is if you force uh, an electron bunch, a lot of electrons, into a electron cluster, you get coherence, uh, and that is enabled by two electrons uh, becoming Cooper pairs, which then become a boson and can form a Bose condensate. And this gets to the point where it gets so much intense field uh, in the coherent uh, electron cluster that it polarizes the protons. And that causes the emission of a uh, neutrino, not an antineutrino, and a positron, the antimatter of an electron. And the antimatter of the electron, the, the, the positron, and the electron that was already there become bound to the neutri neutrino that's emitted, and you get what's called an iton. And that is a, a, a new type of particle, which is a positron, an electron, and an iton in a stable cluster. And that forms a coherent matter, and it, it, it tends to uh, arrange itself in a web-like mesh. And then what you have is just neutrons. You literally just have neutrons. So what do you have? You have a neutron cluster in the core, and you have a positron and electron uh, that cancel out each other's charge without cancelling out each other, and you have a fully neutral particle with however many matter, however much matter is in there. And that is the itonic cluster. And if you drive this harder and harder, it gets to the point where you have self-compression and matter collapse. And that is the electronuclear collapse process. And from that, you get effectively prim prima materia and atoms get reborn through what he says is probably a wormhole about uh, 10 to the minus 33. Uh, and uh, it comes out and, and gets born into a new matter. So, uh, so yes, I've considered uh, uh, antimatter. Uh, the, the, the most uh, useful antimatter that I've considered is the pos positron. And when you think about it, uh, a positron and an electron are both uh, uh, folded and toroidally probably uh, um, uh, zitta biwagang uh, uh, orbiting uh, structures uh, that, that are closed loops of light. And we know this because if you get a positron and an electron in, and you collide them into each other, you get two photons coming out 180 degrees from each other at 511 keV, and that is the mass of the electron. So you get a photon with the energy of the mass of the electron, okay, two of them. From the annihilation of one's matter and then like Sorry? So that photon is effectively that the electron neutrino. Is that what you're what I'm saying is when you get a positron and electron and they uh, annihilate each other, you get an a, a, a one two photons uh, flying out 180 degrees from each other. Because whatever the if you could imagine them as two tori, however they come together, when they get together, they unravel each other. They, one, one is the gozer and the other one is whatever it is from, from Ghostbusters. <laughs> and you get the yeah, two beams me, coming right? out. They're not crossed, they're now coming out. <laughs> and and uh, is, yes. like, the only effect would be from a canceling field like that is you get a space-time compression locally at the event, you know, at the event of where these two uh, opposite charged particles came back into recombination. I, I hate to use the word annihilation because I think it's a misnomer, but I really like the, the word recombination because it's like they, they never really technically go away. They're there. No, they no, are the, the, the energy is converted into vibration of whatever the ether is. <laughs> Man, that was a way better answer than I could have ever asked for. That was amazing, Bob. Thank you so much. Friggin' fantastic. And I'm so glad to see you here again. And I uh, plenty more questions to go. So I'll step off. Thank you okay. very much. I'm awesome. Your many times over <laughs> in the replay. And, and Jeremiah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so let, let me go without any further ado here. I'm going to go to Michael Boyd. Who has been patiently waiting? I'm, I'm trying to trying to get through these as fast as I can. Can you hear me? Okay, Bob. I can. Yes, pleasure to speak with you. 
Good. Um, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I have three, possibly four questions. My first is um, regarding relic neutrinos. Um, would uh, a black hole's jet be a source of relic neutrinos? Um, uh, probably, um, because, uh, well, firstly, I, I kind of disagree with the existence of a black hole. I kind of oh. think it is just a large EVO. And what EVOs kick out is, uh, uh, if, if they're at the level of uh, what would be considered a black hole, is this protomatter through this filament. And the filament is at the, the um, uh, this 10 to the minus 33 scale, according to Matsumoto. I think it, it, he does this uh, electronuclear collapse diagram. Let me, let me grab it. It's, on, um, it's early in the book. And like I say, you can download this and uh, review it at your pleasure. Um, uh, so I, it's show you here. Give me a second. And so basically he has what looks like an accretion disk going into a point here. And then you get an ejection. And then on the outside, you get hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. And on the inside, you get uh, uh, from the, the spout, which would be your white hole, uh, you get your uh, uh, generation of iron and titanium and things like that, heavy, heavier elements. So it's basically proton flux. No, it, it's it's more subatomic, uh, subnuclear. Sub yeah, it's, it's it's gluons, quarks. It's actually just raw energy, and then it just the vibration. Set, like if you if you smash a wall that has several resonances, because there's or anything that has several resonances going on. I I, I kind of described this at, at a conference meeting, I think in 2015, 2016 in Italy, and it's like. Um, you have Jesus, you have Muhammad, and you have Buddha, right? And they are the first things to uh, crystallize out of this raw energy matter, right? Uh -huh. And they're very charismatic, and they provide a template, like a crystal does in your salt crystal experiments when you were five years old. Uh, and so the energy then starts crystallizing on these different things. And some are more likely to uh, occur earlier and some are, you know, they're not very good leaders, and so they fall apart. So you, you can kind of think of it a bit like that. Um, the, the, the matter, whatever settles down, whatever vibration gets to um, a stable state, that then provides a template for more energy that's coming out of, of this kind of proto matter, this, this prima materia. Okay, my, uh, my, thank you for that answer. Um, my other question is, is uh, we were talking about lightning earlier, and I'm curious about two forms of positive lightning, one being the sprite and the other being what's called an elf, the little circles that show up uh, in, the, in the, the upper atmosphere of the earth. With, uh, so do you mean things like the sprites? A sprite, a lightning sprite, like is a positive. Yeah, form of positive yeah actually, light. I was very, very surprised uh, because in Matsumoto's book, he talks about that. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, <laughs> literally, as, as one of the manifestations of th this phenomenon. So uh, it's actually so the, uh, question, the question was similar is that a source of uh, a relic neutrino? Can we make them here? Is my point. Uh, Yes, we can make relic neutrino equivalents called cold neutrinos, and we make them by uh, getting solid matter or dense plasma above 1000 degrees centigrade, whereupon the particles of that matter, including electrons, protons and neutrons, have a kinetic energy sufficient to synthesize electron, uh, 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 neutrino and antineutrino pairs of the cold neutrino type, where the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength, is of the order of microns to millimeters, in which oh. case they can interact with uh, uh, ordinary matter um, uh, in such a statistical way that it's likely, or, or more likely, much more likely than, relic, uh, than relativistic neutrinos. Relativistic neutrinos, you need nine light years of lead to get any sort of meaningful interaction, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to have that in a lab anywhere so yeah, so that's, uh, a lot of, we, that's a lot of lead. that's a lot of lead how much gold i'll take that huh? to the scrappy and i'll be made Less for life gold, I, I <laughs> um so so uh the uh the, the idea of cold that kind of leads to my my last question which is um i'm like studying different uh uh unidentified aerial phenomena 
you've probably heard about the like Tic Tac uh, UFO um, that they saw in the uh, Nimitz encounter back in 2004. Okay, can I can I step on that one first before? Uh, well, I just it's a general question though. I'm just yeah, using that as an example because what we're looking at there is infrared uh, imaging made with uh, infrared sensors uh, on the aircraft. And so basically my question is not what it is or if it's real, it's something we can observe. So I've in my review of all the different objects, I've come across a couple where unlike the Tic Tac, which shows up warm on the IR compared to the background, uh, the ambient background, I found uh, several where it's actually cold. It shows up cold on the IR. And I'm curious if you have any um, any uh, ideas on why why something would show up cold on the IR. And well, I've, I've, be... I've already told you that the exotic vacuum object uh, in, was able to be re-energized by putting it into a, a, a heater element from uh, the researcher Lion. And what that is effectively doing is it's absorbing thermal photons. And so uh, it could be re-energizing itself by extracting energy from the environment. And in, uh -huh. and in fact, use, using uh, this process, you can do what's called single bar thermal extraction at a distance. And so if you go and look at the Lockheed Martin patent that was given awarded in 2013, they use coherent matter production. It's co called coherent matter uh, waves, something like that, um, uh, by Lockheed Martin, 2013. And they actually without actually admitting it, they are absolutely categorically generating these things, initiating them from electrode uh, points uh, in the same manner as shoulders. So uh, it's it's a shame. I, I can't recall whether he they credit shoulders, but they should credit shoulders in that pattern. And it's a bit off for them to have avoided that. So then, it, it, it's called coherent matter waves? It's yeah, a, it's called, co in fact, if you go to remoteview.icu, it's the absolute first article uh, on, on my blog because it's of that importance. Um, uh, and I just discussed it on remote there. view ICU remote view dot ICU the letter ICU it's the, like dot com but it's dot ICU so if you okay. if you go there it's the very first article uh, that I list and you get a link to the patent and related patents and I've discussed uh, this other discussed other patterns that led up to I think that that learning by them and they they say that one of the uses of coherent matter is single bar thermal extraction so where you can extract uh, temperature at a distance. And I believe that this is the way that you can control weather. You create a cold area and a hot area by uh, creating, when, when, when you create a, um, uh, an electron, uh, an exotic vacuum object, uh, as the matter condenses, so, so you need to think of it like this. If you've got a plasma and it, it condenses to a gas, you have to release thermal energy. If you've got a, a gas and you have to put it to a liquid, you have to release thermal energy. IR photons. If you've got a liquid and you want to make it a solid, you've got to release IR photons. And in every stage, you're having to release thermal photons, right? If you did it the other way, you would have to capture them, right? So in the environment, we it is completely replete with nascent charge clusters. That we only get night lightning in part because there are charge clusters in the environment. So we know they exist. They're everywhere. Static electricity is what it's at, right? So they already exist in the environment. And what you can do is use uh, interfering electromagnetic waves to both cause extra clustering, which will raise the thermal temperature of the environment, or to blow up the existing clusters, which will uh, uh, lower the local temperature. And if you have a high temperature over here above the Atlantic and a low temperature over here, you can produce a vortex and that will create your weather system. So if you want to know where Hurricane Katrina came from using the uh, uh, um, the uh, low frequency radar antennas, the Duga arrays, then there's your answer. Very cool. Thank you awesome. so much for your answer. And I'll check out that that web page. And uh, and I like the 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 very the very I enjoyed the last part because if you look at the the Tic Tac data, that's exactly what it looks like it's doing. Awesome. Well, the Tic Tac is the absolute perfect shape if you didn't want a sphere. In fact, what you have to do is you have to have structures of minimum curvature because you don't want to 
you know, you don't want to have any points at which you get a discharge. You need to have an even structure to, to have, the, have the clusters all over the surface to be able to control it in the, in the right way. Um, so just uh, just as for you, you have three options you have a pill question. which is the tic tac you have the sphere which uh -huh. is these all the spheres and and you have a torus those, those are the, the the three objects that you can make that have this curvature in a single surface yeah and there is a torus in the, there's torus is showing up in tic tac too so. well, maybe there is i don't know but that, that's so, what you would have to do if you so uh yes that's that's a very uh interesting and i i enjoy it uh your answers very much and thank you for your time. awesome okay well michael th thank you let me let me move along here to charles charles go for it sir hello oh, to be a, yep big fan of uh yours and john hutchison's so i was kind of trying to categorize the different uh effects of the hutchison or the uh, evos and i've kind of made a list here so please tell me if there's any more or uh if then some of these maybe aren't accurate so there's anti-gravity lift, there's disruption of material, there's transmutation, invisibility, uh, there's fusion of dissimilar materials, there's time dilation, there's weather control and ne neutralizes radioactive material, <clears throat> distorts half-life of materials. There's even communication with spirits and uh, there was a view of an entity from a different dimension and uh, somehow uses zero point energy. What's that? That correct okay do, do you want to just list one and i'll deal with that and we go on to the next one um okay so starting from like anti gravity lift the hutchison effect you, with like the cannonball lifting you think evos are causing so it's essentially you get coherent matter coherent matter forms these uh, north and south uh, pseudo magnetic monopole structures they can skin surfaces this is stated by ken shoulders in his interview which i transcribed uh, it from 2010 and uh, once they skin surfaces, uh, if they are negating the um, the action of the mo of whatever uh, allows for gravity, uh, then they will prevent the action of gravity on the thing that's contained within that skin. And so I believe that he used an iron cannonball. That's one of his most famous examples, and that's the one of the heaviest thing that's been caught on camera. And that is the perfect object to skin uh, because it's effectively the structure, sh shape of a ball lightning. And ball lightning, as I said in my previous talk, um, has been known to carry matter. And in that, for instance, uh, there was a ball lightning that came into the view of someone and it disheveled and out of it came a ga ga couple of gallons or so of water, which means the inside of the ball lightning is below 100 degrees centigrade. And it was negating the action of gravity on those couple of gallons, which weighs, let's say, nine kilos or eight kilos, depending on where your gallons come from. And then... Um, there was another example where sand came out of one. And if that's the case, the sand hadn't sintered. So we know it's below 360 degrees centigrade or something. And it's also a lot heavier uh, than water. And so here we have two examples of historical accounts of bull lightning. And absolutely, 100% certainly, the uh, bull lightning is coherent matter. And coherent matter is uh, what's going on in the Hutchison effect. So uh, the, the, there's no reason to not expect the Hutchison effect to allow for uh, a, a negation of the action of gravity. OK, another one was uh, invisibility of materials. Some metal samples would turn transparent. How OK, yeah. So there's a couple of things about that. There's a classic triangular one uh, which has a curved section on top. That one, in, and because I did a huge amount of video editing and always with the best video editing equipment that was ever available at any point since video editing became a thing that you could do. Um, uh, I know that there's some transcribing gone from the original footage through a number of steps. And what you've got in that, that particular video, and I've discussed with it, this with, at length with John, is uh, frame blending artifacts that lead it to look like it's transparent. I don't believe that, that it was ever transparent. There is then another one, I think it might be a molybdenum bar, uh, which is in a later period, and it comes up and it curves and it moves around. And it's very clear that the central section of that has gone transparent. I believe that that probably is a genuine transparency. Now, if you have coherent matter, then uh, light will just it, it will interact with it in a very, very different way. So whether it's wrapping around it like a black hole or it's uh, just passing through it and changing the translucency, uh, either, either would do. I believe that, though, if you have uh, intense electron clusters within ma 
matter, the light can pass directly through the material. And so, uh, or it, it, it's, it's kind of, it changes its refractive index and, and loses its opaqueness. Let's put it like that in the case of uh, a, a metal. And so when you look at uh, um, that particular video, how I'm seeing that is like, if you take, there's a guy called Thunderfoot and he took, um, potassium and uh, calcium and mix them into a liquid and then he dropped them onto some water uh, for this columbic explosion well what is columbic explosion well that's when you get a lot of charges going into the metal what did he observe it went from silvery to black to transparent and just before it exploded it was in the transparent state and that is the point which is at in my view the highest coherence in the matter so you physically see a metal becoming transparent in that Thunderfoot experiment. And I discussed this in my matter manipulations lecture that I gave in Copenhagen in 2017. You can go and look at that if you want on the MFMP's YouTube channel. So the transparency one, I believe is a real thing. And I believe it's easily explain explainable by coherent, coherent matter. All right, thank you. And for distortion of half-life, sometimes materials would seem to oxidize quicker. How would EVOs maybe cause that? So if you can imagine uh, an electron uh, wants to grab an oxygen uh, with a certain level of intensity, right? Now yeah. imagine you have an electron that has very many orders of magnitude, more desire for oxygen, because two reasons. One, oxygen likes to give up, have an interaction with uh, 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 other materials that, that want to have an interaction with it ordinarily. But all, all, uh, secondarily, oxygen, as I've argued in my monop monopole clutch uh, uh, presentation to the Russian community in 2020, it is the most paramagnetic uh, element, uh, sorry, most paramagnetic molecule of all of the elements before you get up to some of the uh, um, uh, uh, lanthanides. You, you're looking at things like homium and stuff like that uh, up at that end. And so uh, it's unique in that uh, nature. And I believe that that's, that's why it's so important to life in general. It's so important to uh, ball lightning. Uh, it's so important, you know, for instance, Sundaresan and Bokras in, I think, 1994, they, they did a, a replication of the George Oshawa uh, carbon arc experiments underwater. And they found that if they had no dissolved oxygen in the water, they were unable to synthesize iron. And they uh, argued that it was the fusion of two carbons and two oxygens goes to uh, iron 56 and one for helium. Uh, uh, but whatever, without the oxygen, you don't get that. And so I, I believe that the oxygen is absolutely critical uh, uh, it, because of its paramagnetic nature. Great, thank you. And I think you mentioned uh, a lot of this research not only require like one department in the university, but would require multiple departments to study EVOs. And I agree. I, I'm a PhD in electrical engineering. And if you ever need help, I have access to a scanning electron microscope, for instance, and we can maybe do some for tests. Well, that's absolutely fantastic, and we can never get enough time on a SEM. Uh, I've, I've spent a, at least one day in, in each of the last two weeks on SEM, and I really seriously encourage you to look at what I've shared last night, for instance, because I believe we've categorically proven and can repeatably at will produce the magnetic core of ball lightning, and we can show the, the, the entire life cycle. And this is the same thing that did all the damage in the disruption in Hutchison samples. And tomorrow I will be giving a short presentation looking at uh, some optical microscopy I took uh, in Scotland on, in July last year with the collector that acquired the knife that fell into the aluminium. And you will see on the boundary layer, the same structures that uh, I shared uh, uh, from our Vega experiments in Holland. And you can also uh, see that the, it's likely that the synthesized material is carbon, and that's the predominant output from these systems. And so that is on, and it's of the right amount of distance around the metal. And of course, you've got a paramagnetic element. The actual clusters will form on the aluminium because it's paramagnetic. Um, iron becomes magnetic when it's, sorry, steel becomes magnetic because enough of the atoms of iron collect clusters and then they find each other and then you end up with it, it, it de areas becoming magnetic because it's not in a steel state. The, the, it changes like martensite or whatever, it changes its uh, crystal structure to become magnetic. And so eventually the, the steel will, will be affected. 
as well. So I'm going to be sharing that. I'm also going to be sharing some SEM of uh, steel that uh, where it has these um, uh, golden ratio triangles, and that's the cone uh, that goes into the pseudomagnetic monopole, and as it's capturing the material, um, and that's eaten out of the bit which split on iron. So iron behaves, magnetic materials behave much more differently to things like uh, uh, paramagnetic materials like aluminium, and, and for the same uh, overall properties of the thing that's causing it. And, and so um, what you will find is transmutations occurring in this area where the material has disappeared. And uh, so I'm going to be publishing that for the first time tomorrow. And so it's just, it never surprises me. Sorry, it, 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 it always surprises me how much everything is lo logical and consistent uh, between anything that you look at, if it's a genuine thing. Okay. Great, thank uh, you. Yeah, review awesome. your video and uh, try to review some of your work at my lab. Thank you. Okay, awesome. and, fantastic. And, and Charles, thank you as well. L let me let me jump right along to Gerald, sir. And Gerald, could I get you? Yeah, turn on your camera if possible. Hello, everybody. Hey, Bob. It's uh, finally nice. Hi, to Gerald. See. It's uh, WP Enlightened for Truth here. Oh, wonderful. Finally, I get to see you. <laughs> finally, it's been a while, yeah. I don't have yeah. much of a question, unfortunately, because my main question was answered. All the, this group oh, of no. people Ask here, another one. They already <laughs> asked it. Uh, you know, the only thing I have is, a. have you seen David LaPointe's new primer videos? They actually Okay, I was going to do a separate video on this, and uh, but since you asked the question, I'll do it now. Uh, as long as I get a recording to share this, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, it, essentially, um, I don't understand how his patent, patent was granted, patent, patent, depending which side of the pond you're on. Um, uh, basically, it is an nth degree extension of the Boyd Bushman uh, directional uh, uh, magnetic beam paint pattern uh, for Lockheed Martin. So that's my first thing. One could argue that the hole, i.e. where there isn't a magnet, uh, which is the back end of the bowl, uh, separates is from the an nth degree, degree variation of the, uh, of the Lockheed Martin Boyd Bushman patent. However, uh, in that patent by Boyd Bushman, he has the option to have a, an electromagnet there to pulse the magnetic flux. And this then causes a problem because you can have that off, and in which case you have exactly a Le, Le Pont bowl, right? <laughs> Uh, so, so that that's not on the bowl. So, I, I unfortunately, I don't think his patent, even though it's been awarded, is valid. And and the reality is, patent investigators rarely look at the historical patents. And I'm, by that, I mean a long way back, um, or even in this case, a short way back. Um, and so, it's kind of like they'll. Sometimes I believe that they're let, letting these things through, so someone spends their life investigating what they can do with it. And if it yields anything productive, the military will just come in and take it anyway in the US. You can forget, actually. You know, so I think the most useful thing, I mean, we were told this when we set up the MFMP. So don't base anything important that you research in the US, because if you, you they just have these strategic laws with everyone that trades in dollars and basically they can shut you down. So we had to be an international organization and for most of the key discoveries to effectively be developed outside of the US. It's a really sad situation. And the number of people I have coming to me who've said, oh, I did this and I discovered this and, this, and then they locked it all away and that, that's my life's work. And it's like, okay, sorry, mate. Uh, <laughs> but this is, this is the reality. So you only have a choice to be public about it and open. That's it. If you're, if you're working in the States or you're working already for the military. Um, <laughs> so th there we go. So now when, when I'm looking at his current uh, work, he's making all these claims about boron and, and, and hydrogen fusion, which is a known aneutronic fusion. However, there's no evidence. He's just showing some plasma. And, you know, everyone can be forgiven for showing uh, pretty plasma and, and making bold claims about pretty plasma. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to discourage him in any way at all it's absolutely essential that people like him do the brilliant research he's doing and it is different from any other research that's out there in the public domain and i, I must credit him with producing out few but quality videos i should learn from that but anyway um the 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 last point is is that he's got a tungsten electrode in there in his second video and tungsten 1910s as i've already said tonight uh, uh langmuir observed the tungsten producing gas now, what he's showing in that second video is exactly what we've been showing all day long in Vega experiments using tungsten, and in fact, other materials as well. And you, you have David Hudsman in the 80s blowing up two thumb-sized 
uh, tungsten uh, uh, electrodes in in a tung uh, in a electric arc furnace when he was trying to deal with Ormus, right? Yep. It nothing to do with the Ormus. It was electron clusters vaporizing the tungsten. It <laughs> nothing to do with the Ormus. Okay, so interesting, but nothing to do with the Ormus. Okay, um, then you have uh, well, it might have, there might have been some interaction to be fair, but you don't need the Ormus in there to achieve that effect. And the Sapphire Group has shown that because they had their Langmuir probe, which is interesting. That's called that Langmuir probe coming into the uh, double layers, and, and and it vaporized in a few milliseconds. And then if you, uh, Mizuno observed the same thing in, the, I think, 1996, where his tungsten and electrode blew up and it, the COP was calculated about 800 times the input power. Um, but it's, it's the uh, tungsten that is fissioning. And we've shown that categorically what it does because we've created a controlled and less intense, but on a surface layer, uh, 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 exotic vacuum objects, clustering electron clusters, matter clusters, by using a Mars gas on a tungsten welding rod. And we've observed the transmutation that occurs. And we have replicated it in a self-built system by David Boutillier in Canada, based on the learning that has happened since. And so it's fissioning. And so if he yields any excess heat when he's got a tungsten uh, uh, electrode as his core electrode, it's not only that the most of the excess heat will be coming from the transmutation fissioning rather and transmutation of the tungsten. And if you look at the energy yields, it's in the hundreds of over 100 mega electron volts for uh, um, uh, tungsten fissioning and far, far less for your boron uh, uh, proton interaction. OK, so there's a, there's much more that could be coming from that. Secondly, he's talking about this giving a house the possibility of having energy for an extremely long period of time. And that's useless when the principal electrode will be failing and either failing periodically or instantaneously all at once. And you don't know when that might happen. <laughs> it might all disappear like that. <laughs> the whole tungsten electrode, bong, gone. <laughs> so um, he's starting on the journey of finding out what was found out by uh, um, many authors, starting with Langmuir in the 1910s. And uh, all I can do is, what I intended to do was produce a video to reach out to him and say, look, this ain't gonna work, mate. Uh, you know, you got <laughs> but keep doing what you're doing because it's freaking fantastic. Uh, don't stop, but be aware that your tungsten is gonna, you, and it's provably where most of the energy will be coming from because you can see the things flying off. And on a last note, I'll say that the things that are exploding off that he drew attention to in that second video do not care about the magnetic or the electric field. Why? Because they're charged clusters. Thank you for that answer, Bob. That was awesome. I'm still hoping to get you up here, Canada, to view my work. Well, they have to change those silly fascist rules that don't allow, allow someone that's had had COVID twice, but can't, but 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 won't take an experimental jab to travel to me any well. anything on that side of the pond. <laughs> yeah, me as well. Thank you very much. I've seen all your work and I continue to watch and I, and I won't stop. Please. Keep Thank you. On, keep on. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to see what you've done there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and thank you as well. Let me go back to Robert now. Robert. Thanks, Tim. Hi, Bob. Hi, Robert. I, uh, I just uh, have a quite interesting how you can apply. You've mentioned toruses or two tori. Uh, you refer it to see how eddy currents cause a vortical phenomenon. You can see it because it's moving material in the ether. It was when you were talking about this experiment, very simple way to use an ultrasonic cleaner to see the patterns, whether they antinodes where pseudo I think it's actually at the nodes, but I, I always correct myself and say it's either one or the other because I'm not thinking too much when I'm doing a live presentation. But I think Excuse it's actually. Excuse me for nodes. asking these questions. It happened so long ago. I'm not sure if you remember discussing it, but that's part of my research is Florida Seas and Taurus. And um, I was just wondering if you remember how you could elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so you can go and look at the MFMP YouTube channel. Uh, there is a, I think, 18 minute or something video, uh, which is in ultra HD, showing exactly how to walk through that process. Now, okay, uh, all right. Ultrason ultrasonic experiments uh, have been known to transmute uh, since the early part of cold fusion. Uh, one of the leaders in this field is uh, um, Roger Stringham, and he's worked out of Hawaii. And he has most recently worked with Tom Clater 
uh, formerly of Los Alamos National Laboratory. And in their most recent publication, I think it was in 2019, uh, but I think the work was done earlier, he'd moved from the 24 to 46, uh, either 24 or 46 kilohertz ultrasonic uh, uh, transducers to a 1.7 uh, megahertz uh, transducer. The reason being is that he identified, and he identified in a paper in two, uh, 2012, that there was the transmutation was occurring around nodes. Uh, now, he says that at that point in 2012, he's very close, I think, to, to good understanding. He's saying that electrons form a condensate and uh, they encapsulate the deuterons, which also form a condensate inside the electron shell. And then that causes self-compression and you end up with two deuterons fusing. But the reality is that is not what's happening. A vast number of nucleons are being transmuted uh, simultaneously and progressively uh, by a condensate that is stable until it eventually blows up if it's driven too hard. Um, but uh, th the reality is that he was observing this on the nodes, but because they'd moved from, they'd never, uh, the design of their experiments were a transducer in a small resonant cavity with a small amount of deuterium because it's expensive and you want to be able to monitor it, blah, blah, blah. They were never looking for something that was as trivial as uh, vortical structures. And, uh, and uh, the sort of, uh, how can we put, put this? It's like a cyclone and an anticyclone. That's exactly what's going on. And you, you have an impression and an outpression uh, and things coming down and things going up. And, and you, you get to a point where you essentially have a compression and decompression, probably of the structure of the thing that holds matter together. And in one case, it synthesizes heavier matter. In the other case, it synthesizes lighter matter. And if you look at what I talked about last night, which was a, a 2005 or six paper by Rodinov and, and Savatimova, they're saying that there are these strings that are present throughout the universe. And on one end, you get a flux of neutrons being put, uh, neutrinos, relic neutrinos being pulled in. And on the other end, you get them sprayed out. And this produces a system where you have heavy elements and lighter elements at either end of the chain. Sounds like a lot of duality to me, <laughs> uh, which happens no, totally a lot is. in nature. All of that nature is this. You can fight it. You can say it isn't this way, but that's how it is. I'm sorry. No, I, uh, it's interesting that nature is full of dualities. Absolutely. You know, it's like balances each other out. The universe is binary. Opinion may vary. Yeah. <laughs> you were mentioning about spinning materials that creates gravitational or anti-gravity. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is if you have something that's able to effectively uh, prevent the normal interaction of relic neutrinos, if you consider that they are the mode, uh, the means by which gravity is affected. If you're able to uh, uh, either prevent them from interacting or basically it doesn't see the matter in a normal way, like the light can travel through, the relic neutrinos effectively travel through. So there is no push. So it doesn't matter where you are, it, it, there's just no influence of the normal mode of what, how gravity occurs. Is this along the lines that gravity could be radiation instead of... No, no, it's more... I, I, I'm, I'm subscribed quite reasonably, in my view, based on what I've seen, to the push model of gravity. And, and I, be, I believe the, the thing doing the pushing is the relic neutrino flux, which exceeds the mass of all the uh, luminous matter in the universe. I see. And it's, okay. it's a superfluid uh, uh, condensate through the entire universe. This is energy available at any point in the universe. It is the wheel work of nature. And the paper that I will be translating of the Russian Shishkin, with his permission, is arguing that the thing that keeps electrons spinning around atoms is this flux. Okay. Is this on the uh, website? The it, it will be on NFAI. remote viewing. Yeah. It will be a series of about seven or eight articles. I'm working with a uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, to do the translation. So I'll just do a search on your name then. And add vortices yeah. next to well, it. Well, uh, yeah, you can see lots of things on remoteview.icu. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I recommend you. everyone see the presentation from last night because we've got SEMs which are absolutely, right. okay. absolutely yeah. <laughs> crystal clear showing these tori of tori, which are predicted from looking at John Hutchison's work in 2020 and published on February the 17th. And I've shown you guys in the previous presentation that I did 
But okay. that, I, I was blown away on, on Tuesday this week when I literally saw them all over this material. It's like a di- a different clustering sizes. It's like, uh. how is this even real? It's become too easy and too predictable. It's a bit boring now. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and Robert, thank you. Let, let me So let me go now. Actually, uh, let me see if Thomas Anderson, because Thomas has been posting stuff. Thomas Thomas is muted out and he has his video off, but I want to I want to see if I can get him in there and then we'll go to Gabriel after that. There we go. Mr. Hi. Anderson. Cuz he's been blowing up chat, so I want to I want to see if we can get him on to to just ask the questions. <laughs> uh I don't remember the questions except the first one, which was uh, seen. Well, it wasn't a, a question, but more of like a supposition based on what he showed with the black hole and white hole concept. That uh, it seems like anything that goes to a denser state is a careful balance, from what I've seen, of just the right amount of gravitational force to conti- confine the energy and compress the matter in order to get it. If you go too far, then my guess is that most likely it's actually compressing it to the point where it squeezes the energy out of it and it drops to a, such a low energy state that uh, it begins reacting to even gravity the way uh, material does when it hits its Curie point where it loses its uh, ability to react to uh, a magnetic field to be attracted to it. So basically dark matter, meaning black holes are most likely, if that's the case, they're recycling matter. Oh, this absolutely is. I think the whole universe is, um, in fact, I, I, I would argue that any vortical structure pair, um, they work together, vortex and anti-vortex, as mother and father, and uh, they, they take all the dross that's out there and they churn it up and, and make it into fresh material. It's like a, it's like a recycling plant. Well, I could also see, too, if you squeeze stuff enough, instead of compressing, you end up breaking it down. So that, that's exactly kind of, what Matsumoto kind of like, kind of like, is saying. Uh, it's exactly. Yeah, I was gonna say, kind of like running through uh, uh, one of those grinders that they use to turn, you know, what they call me- mechanically separated chicken, where it looks more like uh, strawberry ice cream, where everything comes out as the right yeah. material to create a massive amount but of hydrogen in, in a constant In case area you missed it, get a star. <laughs> I'll read you the second paragraph from 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 the the preface here. Recently, the author discovered a nuclear collapse, which was induced by electromagnetic force in laboratory during studying the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. Several kinds of nuclear reaction were directly induced by the electromagnetic force called electronuclear reactions, ENRs. They were found so far to occur in a special state of hydrogen clusters, which I explained how they form, called itonic clusters or micro ball lightning. The nuclear collapse was one of the most remarkable reactions among ENRs called electronuclear collapse, ENC. Furthermore, very amazingly, completely broken materials by ENC were found to be regenerated again to thin film tubes and films of conventional elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. The latter process was called electronuclear regeneration. And we were showing that all over the SEMs yesterday. And right. the well, actual and they, thing that they does have it. This, they have this whole thing where basically they believe they see where like the, the big bang happened it's like it could possibly be that we just had a moment where basically enough stable black holes had formed almost the equivalent of like a, a shell moving towards each other with such gravitational force towards a central point that they were literally exceeding the you know speed of light limit and slamming into each other and then you know causing an eruption that's what all they're seeing is the remnant of that not meaning that that's the beginning or the end of the universe but just they're close it could, to it could that be that in our local see. environment a right. a 10 to the minus 33 one of these wormholes happened to uh spit out enough mat- proto matter to create a, a universe in our part of space uh, and it, it, there's, it's just like a bubble, and there's another bubble somewhere else, which is a quite com- separate universe. Well, but of course, it's the whole universe. The stuff that they're they're talking about tracking too is the energetic material, meaning like whenever that uh, attraction and, and slamming happens, there's plenty of material that it's exploding into that we consider dark matter. Well, a uh, dark matter is relic neutrinos are dark matter. I- itons could be considered dark matter. In in fact, uh, evos. Uh, could be considered dark matter if they've lost all interaction with all other types of matter. <laughs> right. Dark that's, matter. That, that's matter. the thing is, it's literally something that has dropped to a state where it's become transparent to everything. 
So yeah. getting it to react again and turn into something would probably take a tremendous amount of concentrated energy like that event that, that you were just mentioning. So it ended up fluffing up even more material than so what was it, initially it, ejected. So uh, Shishkin says that if you create torsion fields in the environment, they're very damaging to human body. And the only way to get rid of them is to have a, a disruptive discharge, i.e. the sort of thing that Tesla would do. And that's how you restabilize your local ether structure. Um, so I think it's useful to have regular discharges in your environment. And I think part of nature, what nature is doing when it's doing discharges, it's, it's re-disorganizing the local environment. Right. Like the, uh, what, are you, what are they, I can't remember what they're called, the uh, field effect that's created when a lightning strike, strike happens above the cloud. Like you get the lightning the, the strike we talking, below, and then we were talking about about uh, yeah 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 think, right. Yeah. Basically, it, it they found that it basically uh, stabilized all that radioactive material they thought was going to be lingering around for God knows how long once they had done uh, atmospheric bursts. So, well, I mean, one one way to track on, where people are trying to make nuclear weapons is to 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 look at uh, uh, Krypton eighty five because it's 0.3% of the fissile material when you are producing nuclear weapons, when you are producing plutonium. Uh, it's you're, not you're, normally but, found within our environment anywhere. No, that, and so, because so. of its half-life, it's not normally right. found in the environment. But, it, but Krypton-85 then produces a lot of cl charge clusters in the air, and the way you detect is that there is an unusual amount of lightning storms. That's how ah. you detect. Wow, okay. Kind of like uh, <laughs> that... What, trying to remember what the was it thorium i think that they were uh doping uh lightning rods with to get to basically work as a better uh that tracker. would make complete logic because th thorium <laughs> of which i have a whole bunch of it well they put it in welding rods in, to make the welding in this corolla sand work, here and this is why when i put this 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 wow. is thorium sand from kerala in india right and I, I've been putting this on the SEM last week, uh, last week, the week before, maybe last week. And I actually took this sample in 2017. I had no idea that uh, uh, I had no way of checking whether it was radioactive. But the lo local fishermen told me, oh, the, the sand on that beach is really radioactive. So I thought I'll have some of that. I do know that this is 35 cc and it weighs 35 grams approximately, all by the plastic. This weighs 99 grams, right? Wow. <laughs> and there's a lot of air in here. And right. so... I predicted it was heavy, but since I got this, I got this wonderful Russian-made radio code uh, 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 scintillator, handheld scintillator, and uh, right. it absolutely goes mental uh, when you put it on here. I, I've right. turned off the alarm because it's just too scary to hang around. <laughs> but no, it really is like radioactive. But I used to go and swim for eight years on this beach and surf on it, so I'm not overly fussed. If it was going to kill me, it's already done it. <laughs> So does that discern what uh, it's picking up, kind of like the yeah, so XRF? Actually, no, well, I, I like a really, a, uh, really cheap, uh, cheap method to avoid spending hun a couple hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so XRF. this is another this is another device you can't buy because it's made in Russia. It's a radio radio scan uh, uh, seven hundred one. This is a radio code. So this is a scintillator. This tells you the gamma energy. So what you're looking at on there is the thorium uh, energy peaks from that sand. Okay. okay, this will do the alpha. Now, if I turn this on, there's basically no alpha in here. But when I take the top off that cat, that, that plastic container, there's uh, 600 counts per second, right? <laughs> there's nothing, and then there's 600. This, wow. this, this, so this kicks out a bucket load of alpha, it kicks out a, um, a bucket load of um, gamma, and a bucket load of x rays, right? It's a wonderful material to test HHO with when you can't get access to tritium because of all the rules. You with me? H H so, H yeah. So we, we're going to do we're going to do production. Brown's remediation of nuclear waste, but no one will give us right. the nuclear waste. So I'm starting with something that I can get from the environment, which I got in case I needed to do it in the future. Um, you know, something but, that uh, might help with the concept of electrolysis to break water down. Uh, and the guy who told who gave me the idea for this has passed away the second, unfortunately. So he never got to realize even trying this. Uh, his idea is to run the electricity down a deep well, crack it down there, and then use the rising gas to uh, you know collect the, collect the energy of it rising, kind of like the reverse of gravity of something falling, to run a generator. You know, like the containers that are collecting the two gases. 
while it's separating it and, and rising up to go to its final destination to be stored away and be used, the uh, you know the, the mechanism is attached to a belt that's basically attached to a generator. So you're generating electricity as it rises. Never mind, re, you know, reclaiming the energy in the uh, HHO. Of course, my original idea was to use them separately and start with something like a. Well, but you, you've got a lot of ideas there, but when you when you're comparing what you get from one one of the photons coming out here, let's say it's 62 kilo electron volts. That's one of the lower right. energy photons coming out of here. And you only need four point whatever electron volts is to split hydrogen, right? Right. And that's well, the highest yeah, well, amount of bond see. energy that you can get. Then, but, then um, you, you know, you can split a lot of hydrogen bonds with one decay. And there's bucket loads of decays coming out here. And I tell you, well, the light way to safely discharge is that, that radiation too. You are. So. That'd be a safer way to discharge that discharge that radiation too, rather than just laying around somewhere to you know bake somebody's feet, or yeah, be, I mean, being breathed the, in, the or who knows what, the trap it and use it. Ask yourself what the PAP, original PAP engine was. It was radionuclides in a little shell, ah. which then produced charge clusters, and then he discharged and blew up the <sighs> charge clusters. Done. PAP engine. I thought he was Unlim kind of unlimited uh, kinetic. <sighs> motion energy and an emp that you can get a lot of direct electricity from right well i was gonna say every time somebody talks about generating power from uh you know from uh, cracking water I, I keep going back to basically like uh, tesla's little box he built out of stuff he just got from a hardware store and he was able to run a car back in his day when they were much more power hungry off of that and it's like that sounds an awful lot like basically what they're building with the rain field uh, generators, where they're basically taking a negative material and a metal electrode and then a positive material and a, yeah. uh, an electrode. And as the water runs across each of those components, it's getting charged by the material before it hits the electrode yeah. and it yeah. discharges. You build that inside of a box that would probably uh, work to, you know, to generate the power you need, but you could also probably use those two materials to attract the hydrogen and the oxygen instead of just being the electric charge back it up with the charge of like the flooring that's built into Teflon. You know, the uh, you could probably use something even more uh, positively charged than uh, like urethane by using cesium, because that's supposedly the highest uh, positive charge out of all the elements that we've got. But out of uh, all the it has ones, the lowest it. work function, which means you, 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 it will release an electron with the lowest amount of input driving energy. Ah, okay, okay. So the flooring is basically, uh, the, the fluorine is almost the opposite. It wants an electron more than anything else. Right, right. Okay, so you put that on the positive side to basically uh, yeah. assist the positive draw of power, yeah. creating a, a de deficiency of uh, electrons. So, fluorine's really nasty stuff. <laughs> right, that's why it's probably much better that it be tied up to something. You heard of chlorine gas in the First World War? Time. Oh, don't give me fluorine gas. <laughs> right, well, and they're getting more and more of it every time they go digging in the ground and pulling more oil up because yeah. those salts dissolve in the oil. A lot of people yeah. don't get that. It's a solvent. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the thing is it. about the fluorine, it's so reactive, it'll always be something else very quickly. Just hope it's not part of your body. <laughs> or it doesn't form something like uh, hydrofluoric. Uh, what is yeah, it? that's that really nasty rain. stuff. Acid yeah. rain, yeah. So they we're having problems with that in Oklahoma because the fire blew that's out. That's the same. At yeah. the top of the, the refineries, like, oops. You're supposed well, to keep that flame lit. <laughs> Yeah, so so let me um, actually let me go to Gabriel now, who who okay. has patiently had his hand up, and then I'll, I'll go to Bernie after that. But, but Gabriel, oh, go for it, sir. Hopefully, I covered it. So, thank you, it, 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 thank Mr. you, Mr. Anderson. Anderson. <laughs> hello. Yes. Um, hello, Bob. It's Hi, a Gabriel. pleasure. Hey, it's Gabriel. a pleasure for me talking with you. I am asking this question reading the Google Translator because I speak Portuguese, I'm Brazilian. My question is, what is the relationship between EVOs and longitudinal electric scalar waves, poor scalar waves and torsion waves? If I don't come back thanking you for the ones where, it's because I don't understand English, but I will see the ones where translation on YouTube, sorry. And thanks in advance for the reply. I'm not entirely sure I caught everything that you said. I'm very sorry. Um, and, and he pasted a bunch into chat as well. That was that was did why. He? Yeah, he, he did. Uh, let, let me kind of scroll back up there. I um, see lots of laugh. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned the Jesus, Buddha, and uh, Muhammad. I, I pasted a joke in there. So, um, let me see. So we, he was asking, what is the relationship between EVOs, longitudinal as electroscalar waves, pure scalar waves, and torsion waves? I think that was okay. that was his first question. So, um, in in the case of uh, how how shoulders viewed this, uh, the exotic vacuum object is both a receiver and a transmitter of whatever scalar waves are. <laughs> so there is a direct relationship with how you can, can uh, interact with them uh, um, through scalar waves. I'm not an expert on scalar waves. I'm an expert on things I can see and repeatedly see and produce. Um, uh, in, in the terms of torsion uh, waves or fields, um, I, I believe they are... Uh, in possibly the Rayleigh neutrino condensate, which being a condensate, it means that every part of the universe can immediately know when part of that, that, that condensate is affected because it's all effectively, no one knows which particle is which. <laughs> it's all the same particle everywhere, right? It's like, it's like that whole theory about, uh, was it Feynman? I don't know. So, some, someone said that there's only one electron. Maybe it was Wheeler. Wheeler said there was only one electron <laughs> and it's everywhere. Well, you could argue that because the uh, relic neutrino condensate is a condensate, it, from here to the other end of the universe, if you influence the condensate here, you influence the other end of the universe, and it's an instantaneous thing. Um, a torsion wave would be in this superfluid, superconducting condensate, um, or certainly superfluid, not necessarily superconducting. Uh, and so once that, that torsion is set up, it spins. And it spins and it spins and it spins. And because it has a very low level of interaction with ordinary matter um, and you are not designed to live in a torsion field, uh, I believe that's why people like Shishkin are saying this is not good for health. Um, and when you get any vorticity going on, you will have some for focusing of that vorticity, which will lead to condensation. So Shishkin has done a number of experiments where he's taken a 5,000, I believe, RPM motor, maybe it's 20,000, and he's put cones of different materials, everything from titanium and iron to PTFE. And he's then had X-ray film at a distance from these, and he's seen these birdies, which are the explosive uh, uh, um, witness marks of an exotic vacuum object. So uh, spinning, the ether spinning the relic neutrino condensate, which is both in the environment and through all solid matter, uh, then using a cone will naturally lead to a focal and a condensation of that and a production of exotic vacuum objects. So that, that is, in my view, the relationship between uh, torsion fields and, uh, and EVOs. And so if you can if you can spin a solid material such that you create EVOs, then EVOs in turn, if they were clustered enough, could, you could imagine, also spin influence the environment around them. And, and so th there's, th there's a, just like a transmitter and receiver, one, one influences the other. Uh, so I, I, can, I, I have more to say uh, with certainty on, on the, the relationship between torsion fields and uh, EVOs and, and and the relationship between them uh, than I have to say on, on the first part of your question. So I think that's that's what I can offer at that point. Awesome, awesome. Well, so let me let me go to, and we're, we're starting to push closer to our time. Let me start, okay. let me go to Bernie next. Bernie? Hey, Bob. I'm Hi, Bernie, how you doing? Very good, my friends. Uh, I'm gonna have to, first I have to admit, I'm gonna have to catch up on your most recent work. That sounds pretty awesome uh, discoveries uh, there. Honestly, I think it's it's probably the conclusion, really. I, I, all I'm gonna be doing is f f finessing uh, the next time on the SEM, but I, I think we now can repeatedly produce the core of ball lightning, which is, in my view, the 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 core behind coherent matter is is the core behind all exotic technologies so and and to see it and to see it repeatedly having predicted what it should be and that prediction be in line with all the russian the japanese and the american and, and whoever's looked into this with any serious le length of life uh, um it's it's been a deep honor and and thank you for your support over the period much love brother i 
can't wait. I'm excited. I regret that I haven't kept up on it lately. I've been uh, out the last couple of weeks fight, fighting strep throat, but I'm over it oh, now. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> and good. Uh, that really excites me. And um, what sort of conditions, like, do you think it would be possible to reproduce that core through uh, in the electrolysis process in water or only in like an air plasma? So if, if you want to, it's, it's nicely detailed in uh, Takaki Matsumoto's book to produce itonic clusters. Uh, he used a one millimeter lead wire. He used 120 volts, I believe it was, uh, a number of eight uh, millisecond length pulses in potassium hydroxide. Uh, what, I think it was one molar solution. I'm just going to the page right now. Uh, and then he used a, a copper accretion plate uh, and counter electrode. And the reason you use copper is because uh, you've got no carbon in there. It's highly conductive. Copper, copper uh, doesn't absorb hydrogen, so it can't readily form uh, uh, be damaged by this in the way that he did it. So yes, he uh, in experiment S70, he used potassium hydroxide 1.5 molar uh, per liter and 80 millisecond pulses uh, uh, 20 second off and only four pulses. So the experiment was uh, 80 milliseconds plus 20 seconds times four. You should, you should probably be able to do that in your lunch break. You, you need a short length of lead, access to a 120 volt socket and a small cup of coffee <laughs> and, and a bit of potassium hydroxide. And, and an SEM would be good. So that's probably the simplest uh, um, and lowest cost method to do this. If you want what we have seen to have been producing in the Vega experiments, you need a two millimeter sheet brass. Uh, brass has a number of properties that are advantageous. It's highly conductive. If you go and look at Lafferty's book, uh, I haven't really discussed this, but Lafferty's book, which was the principal reference of Ken Shoulders when he started to look at John Hutchison's work, um, it lists after tungsten as, as, as brass as one of the most uh, advantageous electrodes. I've already talked about the conductivity of copper that's in the brass, but you've also got, and I talked about this yesterday, you have copper oxides, which are photoelectric emission uh, emitters, and you have um, uh, you have uh, zinc oxides form, which are both piezo and pyroelectric. And so you have all of the things that you would want in an environment as a cathode uh, to be able to uh, synthesize uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects. Then what you need to do is bunch them. So what we had is we had a flat plate. In fact, I'll show you. It's here. <laughs> Uh, so, Hank, Hank, uh, we have this flat plate. So this is the thickness of the brass. Okay. okay. And then there's two pieces of brass on top with, with a little uh, gap in between, right? And a few centimeters above that, you have the anode. And uh, it was four microwave transformers in a roughing pump level of uh, a, a low pressure air. Okay. Why do we want air? Because we want oxygen in there for its paramagnetic nature and to produce the oxides on the brass that do the funky work with the photon and, and, and piezo and thermoelectric emission. And uh, uh, we want the oxygen to uh, play a role in clustering of, of the charge clusters because of its paramagnetic, unique paramagnetic nature. And so um, when you have the electrons, and, and the experiment actually to, to create this sort of worm-like pattern, if I get it out and make it clearer to you, uh, to create this uh, worm-like pattern on here, like, like woodworm, okay? So this is a magnetic electron fluid condensate, and it, it has alternating north and south magnetic poles. And you can go and see this in incredible detail, the structures that it's producing. And what it's producing, it's producing this vortex matrix, which essentially is exactly was as predicted by Maxwell in the 1800s. Um, and there's very much more current research on, on, on condensates that point to the structure being the only structure that could be forming that does this. And so you get this electron bunching in that gap that starts uh, producing this uh, uh, Bose condensate of electrons as a fluid, and that captures ions. And in that zone, you have such a, a density of this condensate of electrons that there basically is no Coulomb barrier. Uh, and th this, I, I talked about this in my presentation last night, the, the 2005-6 paper of Rodinov and Savatomova. And they talk about this, and their first reference is this book that no one's seen, and, but now you can get. <laughs> that was their first reference. Um, and uh, uh, in, in that zone, um, you can have mass numbers of uh, uh, transmutations occurring. And as it falls down, it falls down, and, and it produces a hollow sphere. 
And the hollow sphere is, uh, it has about a one micron internal skin, skin, and then it has these cellular structures on the top. And the cellular structures uh, uh, are actually smaller toroidal clusters or individual spherical clusters that are clustering. And then it grows and more come on and grows. But what you are looking at is the collapse of the overall wave function when the coherent matter has, has finished. When it's actually happening, it actually looks like a little plasma ball, right? It's only when the coherent matter collapses that you see the overall structure. And that's when, the, that's when the music stops. And so the ball can get bigger and it, and it just reorganizes. So you can imagine, how, how should we put this? Imagine the, the, the surface of a pond, right? And, and you've got little balls and you can put them on the pond. Well, they, they can organize themselves wherever. If you keep putting more balls on, they end up trying to organize themselves into a, 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 a completely sealed unit. In fact, they use these to prevent evaporation from reservoirs, okay? Uh, if you can imagine that on a sphere, that's what's happening. More of these charge clusters are coming in. They reorganize themselves, their wave functions, and, and the sphere can get bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's still hollow. This craziness in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and only when the wave function of all of those structures collapses, when it runs out of electrons and the music stops uh, um, being fed electrons, uh, th then you, you end up with this solid thing being, being formed. But all the time that it exists, it can transmute matter. And uh, the, 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 the Russians calculated it's out to about 100 microns. And our analysis over very many systems points out that it's over about 100 microns outside of the event horizon. That's fascinating. That's awesome. So um, myself, all of my experiments are like um, through electrolysis. Um, I get, I see it as alchemy and I've gone from two approaches of like David Hudson's as well as Mehran Keshi's um, monoatomics and aspects of it and then connected it with uh, Sir Isaac Newton's writings and translations of alchemy and then um, going from more of the ancient alchemists aspects but putting it through uh, minimal amounts of both AC and DC electricity as well as uh, just small circuits with no electrical input at all uh, using like uh, many different coils and then nano coating layers as well as um, like uh, pure elements from, I only used lead once, but I found it had a very heavy, heavy presence and energetical drain uh, just from entering the room uh, when I had used it one time. So I haven't really uh, gone back to it too much, but like I make monoatomic uh, gold, silver. Um, I would like to look at that. I have, I have some monoatomic gold in here as well. <laughs> That was made in uh, uh, in Hungary. I have analyzed that, and it is super fluffy. Like the the, the nanostructures, we couldn't look at. We couldn't find a, a scale that we could see something that wasn't more fluffy. <laughs> so, uh, we saw seen. We actually, I actually analyzed the, the the leading brand of atomic nanoatomics, and uh, it was rubbish. Uh, so so the commercial thing, in my experience, the, the one that was most leading was just nonsense. Uh, it was just uh, whatever a calcium carbonate or something with I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, th th that monatomic you've got there. So as, as I said, with this Buddha and this uh, Jesus and this Muhammad, right? What you do is that that is your um, your template. The monatomic is the template. Why is it the template? It's because it is vibrating at the frequency that the nucleus of that atom can vibrate. And it can only vibrate at that precise frequency when it's a monoatomic, okay? So that is your philosopher's stone for whichever element you're trying to synthesize, okay? That is the crystal nucleus on which you want to grow. Now, you have to do the electronuclear collapse of Takaki Matsumoto, or however which way you want to do it, to create the protomatter that then is in search for something to follow. And, uh, you know, it, 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 what, what alchemists were doing was raising a body of material uh, over 1000 degrees centigrade. And it, what you would want to do is ideally hit a resonance. And that's basically what I can offer. Exactly. So that, that's exactly what I theorize is that you can get cold okay. of elements, uh, as Isaac Newton states, when they're in their crystalline form. And I've turned copper, gold, silver, zinc, 
and a few other metals into this pink uh, crystalline form. And then the atomic hydrogen coming off of the um, cathode side of the electrolysis reaction will bond and make the cold fusion into the next metal if you're putting in that right resonant frequency of that metal. For instance, like these pure tungsten rods I have that uh, when they've had copper- Ber Bernie, we're, we're almost out of time, sir. I, I wanna try and get to Jared real quick. We'll talk. Okay, so Jared, Jared, do you think you can go really quick? We got about two minutes left. Yeah, you got a uh, UFO of your right shoulder. Oh yeah, that's what I'm going to be talking about um, <laughs> later. Uh, so just one quick question um, about the EVOs and ball lightning. Uh, has any of your research led you down looking at solitons and how they might be responsible for it? Some of mine has suggested that ball lightning may be a, a cavitation of solitons in a confined space. Just wondering if you've seen any co connection correlations between solitons and EVOs. Uh, well, the basic toroidal sol uh, EVO is a soliton. It's a solitary wave. So uh, straight up from the bat, it is a so it is a soliton. Uh, it's a, a, and 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 basically it's a standing wave. So if you go and look at the 1954 paper by John Archibald Wheeler, he talks about uh, geons. And geons are a standing wave, one going one way and one going the other, that creates a structure which is like a bead chain uh, where you have enclosed spaces of, of electric field and between them you have magnetic field. And the whole thing is held together by a magnetic vector, uh, by a gravitational vector. And so uh, that effectively is your soliton structure that is your, in my view, something similar to that. It is what is building the basis for EVOs. And uh, uh, when you have uh, one wave going around one way and one go wave going around another way and you add more energy to it, if you can make coherent matter, then you're adding the same energy into the same space time. OK, so uh, it doesn't occupy any more space, uh, uh, but it has a lot more energy within it. Uh, um, and so that, that's how you get some so co coherence. And uh, the only the only thing is, is when when these get to a certain point, they 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 eat up the in my view the relic neutrino con, uh, flux from the environment. And uh, I've already talked about this uh, when um, Sh uh, Shishkin had a cavitator. The reason for this cavitator uh, in two thousand and one, I believe it was, uh, which rotated at about five thousand RPM, <clears throat> he was trying to produce something. I think to contract for uh, mixing oil and water, producing an emulsion of oil and water. But he uh, felt very, very bad around the uh, having been exposed to it. Really, he felt quite ill having been exposed to it. So being a nuclear scientist, he decided to throw on a whole bunch of uh, X-rays uh, films. And then he saw these first birdies structures uh, of these uh, solitons coming out. And he says they are string vortex solitons, and they are the neutral form of exotic vacuum objects. And he credits uh, Ken Shoulders. He says when they explode, the electrons come out with a velocity of up to 10 kilo electron volts. And the matter that has been captured within them, which can be neutral as an overall cluster and passes through the water in the chamber, through the metal of the chamber, through the air, through the, the packaging on the X-ray and into the X-ray, when they... Uh, um, explosively unpack, as he describes it, they eject the ions that have been captured on their passage through that material. And they eject them with such velocity that the number of greys produced is sufficient to destroy red blood cells and cause uh, DNA damage to uh, um, uh, white blood cells. And this is well characterized. The research started in earnest in 2009 in Dubna, and they've researched on mice as well, uh, and, and, and uh, also plant, plant and other, other uh, types of uh, uh, living organisms. So they, they know very well that this can damage. So anyway, anyone working near a spinning thing, welding, ultrasonics, all kinds of different systems that people use all of the time, they will be kicking out these uh, uh, clusters at various levels of intensity. So, um, uh, but you can put them to good use. You can put them to good use for remediating nuclear waste and so on. So um, yes, the, 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 and he calls them solitons, string vortex solitons. And he says at, the, at least that they are most likely condensed uh, relic neutrinos. Now, why is this, why, why would he know this? 
He didn't publicly say this, but I have said this publicly since. In 2018, at that conference in Sochi, he said off the cuff that his device would produce this flux of these string vortex solitons up to a period of time, and then it wouldn't. And then he found the only way to produce them again was to physically move the generator to another part of his lab. What does that tell you? So it's not a constant source of neutrino flux. He used up all the local flux and had to go So somewhere this is else. why you can't put people in solitary confinement because it's your connection to reality. That's why it's unbelievably cruel to put people into solitary confinement because this relic neutrino flux cannot travel through glass. It gets reflected partially by like sunlight. So if you're in a confined space, you will, all living organisms use these things. So you will literally lose reality. People go mad because they don't have connection to through reality, through the relic neutrino flux. It's unbelievably diabolical to do this. I don't know who worked out that this is what it does to, to consciousness, but it's really cruel. Um, so that's my personal beef with the abuse that goes on with isolation in that sense. But so the, the cohering structures are capturing the relative, uh, relic neutrino flux. Now, why do we know that this is in the environment? There was a researcher from uh, China and a team called Xu Enzhu, and he worked between 1989 and 1999. And he found that during three body alignments, that solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, there uh, were four properties that he could observe that changed in the environment. One, there was a sideways movement in a tensioned piece of metal. That means something that was diffusing from outside of the penumbra in was able to exert a force on a metal plate. This is the pressure force of gravity. This is the relic neutrino flux. He didn't know it was that at the time, okay? Second thing, the spectral emissions from elements changed either inside or outside of the three body alignment uh, uh, field. So light traveled at, at a different, in a different, or the, the light that was coming back was different. And, and Bob, we're, we're over time, sir. Okay. Right. Okay. No worries. Oh yeah, I mean, if you want to wrap that statement up. There, I just there's, just, to... there's, there's two more factors. Nuclear radioactive material, he had atomic clocks, uh, and he went into the American uh, uh, records. They use rubidium-87 uh, and cesium-137. They change their decay rate in a three-body alignment. Okay, so that's a neutrino interaction. Therefore, it must be uh, some form of neutrino doing that. And the last thing was metals, in his case, a lead tin alloy, crystallized in a linear diffraction pattern when it didn't outside of, of the three-body alignment. All of these are due to the diffusion of relic neutrino fluxes, in my opinion. And that is why Shishkin uh, observed that he condensed all of the relic neutrinos within the event horizon of his generator, and he had to physically move it. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, well, let me let me do this, Bob. This you blow my mind like twenty different times here. I, so I, I'm putting this on speaker view. Everyone, let's give a giant applause to Bob Greener. Bob, th that absolutely, absolutely tremendous. You just you have such an amazing wealth of knowledge. I mean, I've really never seen anything like it. I cannot thank you enough for doing the Q&A with us. I'm, I'm so glad we were able to get you back in. It's a pleasure. And I would really seriously encourage people to see the, the work in, in, that was presented this week. Um, it's now a science. Uh, it's a reality. People can replicate it. And uh, I, I look forward to a time when whole universities are researching different aspects of what this technology can do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you again, sir. So, so what I want to do now is, um, let me see, I, I want to go to Dr. John Brandenburg. Uh, let me do an intro first, though. Um, so 